Australia's economic collapse. In this video, I'm going to share information with you that you will not get from the mainstream economists or the mainstream media. And we're going to touch on uh, the Chinese economy, uh, the economy in Europe, the economy in the US, and how it all impacts Australia. And our economy is sick, folks. Our economy is sick. Also, we will be doing this video in two parts. Uh, so this will be part one, and tomorrow I'll upload part two. So let's begin with the Observatory of Economic Complexity. And you can see Australia is ranked 82 of 157. So we're pretty, we're pretty poor there. Uh, we actually used to be quite high, uh, but now we're really poor. What that simply means is that our, our economy is not very complex at all. In fact, it's very simple. We dig stuff out of the ground and we ship it overseas. And we create a whole bunch of debt and buy property. That's our economy right there. Okay, it's not that simple, but that's basically what it means. So it means that we don't have a diverse range uh, of you know economic sectors. So our, our economy is really, really simple. We rely on very, um, uh, very few niches, uh, very few different uh, sectors there. So what's interesting, <clears throat> what do we export? Iron ore, petroleum, gas, coal, gold, uh, what's funny is we ship all this stuff overseas. Um, it then gets made overseas and we buy it back um, at a much more expensive price. And we'll explore that a little bit as we get into the video. And you can see the uh, country that we uh, export to the most is China, uh, almost 40%. Uh, Japan used to be our largest trading partner uh prior to the gsc and and now you can see china so we've really hooked our economy up to uh, the china story and at the moment china don't really like us very much we've very much annoyed them so with imports once again we import most of our stuff from China, uh, Thailand, Singapore, South Korea, Malaysia there, you can see the numbers. The United States are our second uh, largest uh, country we import from. And Germany there, Japan. So you can see, you can see that there. So the most, uh, most import products, uh, we import refined petroleum, cars, uh, crude petroleum, broadcasting equipment, delivery trucks, cars, all that sort of stuff. Uh, also medications, um, we import uh, import medications as well. So we ship all of the materials overseas for it to be refined, to be constructed, to be built, to be made, computers, techs, everything. And then it comes back our way and we pay a much, much higher price for it. And that's actually going to have consequences, in my opinion, on the Australian economy. All right, so you saw that we uh, rely heavily on China, uh, our trade with China. And the China credit impulse has now turned negative uh, quite a bit. So uh, we've seen commodity prices come off the boil. Now, China have done that on purpose. They've actually um, sold a lot of inventory into the market um, to to cool commodity prices. Um, I'm still bullish on commodities moving forward. It really depends on what central banks do moving forward as well. However, in the short term, this doesn't bode well for Australia. Now, we're also seeing some signs of Chinese iron ore demand moderating. Um, also, we're hearing that Brazil uh, have intentions to increase uh, their output in uh, iron ore. Uh, so that uh, 
could put downward pressure on the iron ore price. And in Australia, we've now got calls for a uh, mining tax. And every time there's calls for a mining tax is usually at the peak of the iron ore price. So let's uh, let's wait and see. So as we saw uh, in the uh, obs Observatory of Economic Complexity, uh, you can see that Japan, prior to the GFC, was Australia's largest uh, trading partner. Uh, but now that's China, where nearly 40% of our exports uh, go to. So, you know, China's not very happy with us at the moment if they continue to, uh, well, let's just say the Australian economy could be in deep, deep uh, doo-doo if uh, China really want to want to punish us and China Commerce Ministry we cannot be blindly optimistic about China's foreign trade this year uh, you'll see another warning later in the video uh, coming out of China about trade and, and the economy so China's spending wave peaked in 2011 goes down forever so <clears throat> this is the other thing about hitching our, our wagon our economic wagon to China. In my opinion, uh, I I I look at China's demographics. I look at their their economy and uh, and moving forward, I I don't think they are the superpower that uh, you know and and going to replace the US dollar as a reserve currency. I don't see it. I've seen a report that uh, China's uh, population is going to be under a billion people in the next twenty to thirty years. So I think the whole China story is overblown. Um, and and look, they've got a lot of debt issues themselves. I've shared in uh, other videos that I think that it's uh, uh, that India and Indonesia uh, have a much brighter future over the next 20, 30 years plus. And breaking China's production prices climb at the fastest pace since 2008, up 9% in May from a year earlier, fueling worries about global inflation. And how is that going to impact Australia? Well, I think this is going to impact Australia in a big way. Why? Well, as we saw before, we don't make stuff in this country. Yeah, sure, we dig it up and send it out overseas, but it's made overseas and then it's shipped here. So that uh, inflation that is uh, being created in China, they're going to be exporting that inflation. And guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be importing that inflation. Uh, you can see Australian imports have skyrocketed over the last, uh, what, three decades. Um, or four, four decades, actually. Now, in 2020, we did have that big fall because of the cerveza sickness and the lockdowns and whatnot. But that is now powering back up in a big way. And one of the other things that, uh, you know, so commodity prices have tipped over a little bit, but shipping hasn't. Um, shipping costs from Shanghai to Sydney has doubled in the last 12 months. Um, so it hasn't been as expensive as, as like Shanghai to LA and, and whatnot, but uh, it is still doubled. And that is going to continue. And so there's these costs that are going to be passed on to Australian consumers. So it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, we look at uh, uh, the containerized freight index. It's just going up and up and up. So another shipping crisis looms on COVID fears in southern China. Waiting times have skyrocketed from the Shenzhen port from half a day to 16 days. And I've seen a whole bunch of reports saying that uh, a lot of people working on those docks, truck drivers, etc., are all sick, and uh, and that there's a whole bunch of ships um, just waiting uh, to to be loaded up. And so, as I said, that's going to have uh, that's going to have an impact on on shipping costs, and for Australia that relies so much on imports, it's going to have a big impact. So, what impact is this going to have? on the Aussie dollar or where is the Aussie dollar heading and when you have a look at this ratio of emerging market equities versus the S&P 500 total returns 
and have a look at the Aussie dollar. Um, well, put it this way. Um, Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital is, uh, well, he's on a trade that the Aussie dollar goes sub 40. So that's sub 40. We haven't seen that uh, really since, what, around uh, 2002. Um, <clears throat> there was a particular incident that happened around that time. I'm not going to go into. Um, but you listen to mainstream Aussie economists, they've been saying that the Aussie is heading towards 90 cents by the end of the year. Um, now, just since the talk of uh, the Fed raising rates or tapering has sent the Aussie down from nearly 78 cents to 75 cents. Um, and that's quite a big jump in pretty much you know, 20, a 24 hour period. Um, so if the <clears throat> if we rely so much on imports and our Aussie dollar falls significantly, let's say it falls to 60, 50, whatever, that means that the cost of imports are going to rise. That's inflationary, inflationary. Um, so these are impacts. So, so if we get this inflation in Australia, what's going to happen to our yields? What's going to happen to interest rates? If interest rates rise, what's going to happen to our debt levels? Now, the other inflationary thing is petroleum, fuel. So we... You, if you're in Australia listening to this video, watching this video, <clears throat> you will know uh, just from the, um, the, the the cost of fuel back last year uh, to, to where it is now at the uh, fuel stations, petrol stations, or as my American friends say, gas stations. Um, now I'm expecting, so this is crude production, which is still low, and I'm expecting production to... Well, put it this way, I'm not expecting production to uh, skyrocket. So I'm expecting um, the price of oil um, to at least maintain around this level that it's at now. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes higher. I'll be much more surprised if if the um, price of oil falls below $50 a barrel than it hitting $100 a barrel. I, I'd be more surprised if that happens. So I think it's more likely that we see a hundred dollar barrel of oil than fifty dollar barrel of oil. Now I'll put a link in the description to this article written by my good friend Tarek Brooker. U.S. high inflation rate could leave Australia struggling like the nineteen seventies and eighties. It was a really good article. I'll put a link in the description. You can read it later on. So when we look at what central banks have been doing this year, we can actually see on a, on a percentage basis um, that, that the RBA, the Australian Reserve Bank of Australia, has been growing its balance sheet as a percentage of GDP more than any other central bank. More than any other central bank. And this is an old chart, but um, you can see that Australia's monetary base is skyrocketing. And according to Morgan Stanley, they expect that the pace of QE will continue unchanged at $5 billion a week. Now, I know that comparing that to what the Fed does on a dollar term uh, is, is not kind of comparable. But the Australian economy is much, much smaller. Uh, I think we're about the 13th largest economy in the world. Uh, and... Uh, our debt and balance sheet and all that is is much much smaller uh, to the Fed. So with base money skyrocketing and the Fed can oh sorry the Fed the RBA continuing to do QE and we've seen government fiscal deficits absolutely skyrocket with uh, all sorts of payments and subsidies. Um, you know people were able to take. Uh, money out of their retirement accounts and uh, and that did get raided uh, we've actually seen savings uh, skyrocket people's savings skyrocket uh, and obviously with the uh, housing market that's been going crazy uh, in my next video that I'm doing uh, 
property market warning, uh, you'll see exactly how much debt has been created just in the last 12 months uh, compared to any other time in Australian history. And uh, I, I don't know if people are actually aware of what's going on and how scary it is. So we're seeing broad money uh, increase dramatically. Base money, broad money. Now, this is an old older chart. I, I, I can't get a newer chart. I haven't got a newer chart than this, but uh, Australia's broad currency currency um, is absolutely skyrocketing at the moment. And if this chart's anything to go by, then the five-year CPI growth is um is going to follow suit uh, especially when you take into account uh <clears throat> the supply issues that australia's got because we don't make nothing here we rely on basically china but other countries to produce things and send them to us and we know the cost of goods have gone up so the import import prices uh the, sh the cost of shipping has gone up so and by the time uh, you and I buy things at the at the store, we're going to be paying a heck of a lot more for it. So, with that, <clears throat> Peter Green, who's a sector manager, Australian Equities at rating agency L Lonsec, uh, Lonsec, I think it is. Um, now he suggests that the amber lights are flashing on inflation for every investor at every level. Uh, he said everyone needs to be prepared. He says inflation is the elephant in the room and many of our investment portfolios were designed with infla uh, sorry, deflation in mind, uh, not inflation. Uh, it's been a generation since inflation has been on the agenda in a significant fashion. So he's actually warning that, uh, that you know, our, our portfolios, our, our mindsets are on deflation, that None of us have had to really worry about inflation for a generation, maybe even multiple generations, really. Um, but also we're, we're seeing CEOs in major listed companies uh, that have been making loud calls that inflation signals in both raw materials and labor costs are already here. The CEO of James Hardy, Jack Chung, last month warned that the construction sector was in quite um, a strong inflationary environment. In fact, a very strong uh, inflationary environment. And we've seen, you know, uh, the government produce things like Home Builder Grant, which is just creates more demand for construction at the same time that there's supply constraint issues. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is going to have an impact. We're already seeing it. So um, I shared one of Australia's... Uh, or Queensland and Australia's largest builders inform me that uh, steel prices are going up 17.5% on the 1st of July. Uh, that they've only just started taking new contracts again. They stopped taking contracts back in February. Um, that builder uh, also said that they're taking 350 days to build a house. 350 days. So I come from the construction game. My background was in construction and uh, 350 days is insane. Now, <clears throat> we're already seeing that uh, suppliers are now allocating uh, their resources to the big builders. So small builders just aren't able to get uh, supply uh, anymore. And this is going to have big, big uh, ramifications. In fact, I... I know some builders who have now already gone belly up, um, gone broke. And and there is concerns, warnings that uh, more and more builders are going to go broke this year and next year. And, uh, and, and we'll touch on that in a second, that if that happens and plays out, and I actually think it will, uh, the impact that that's going to have on uh, the uh, employment market so we'll touch on that in a sec. Uh, the concerns among CEOs have since widened beyond the construction sector to the food and hospitality sectors where there's staff shortages right across the country. In the listed agricultural sector, wage inflation scare recently shot a hole in the share price of the Costa Group. The Geelong-based Costa Group endured a 23% 
share price fall in a single session. Uh, that was after the CEO, Sean Hallahan, warned of labor shortages affecting the company's ability to staff its food production activities. And uh, we got the Commonwealth Bank's Gareth Ed. He's the uh, uh, co- uh, economist there. He has just issued a new warning. He said job vacancies are very high across a range of industries and skill levels. The labor market is tightening very quickly and a lift in wage growth is forthcoming as firms compete for labor. Now we've seen that uh, the Fair Work uh, Commission have increased the minimum wage by 2.5% for 2.2 million Australians. So our workforce is about uh, 13, just over 13 million. Uh, So 2.2 million of those. are getting a two and a half percent wage rise, so you can lock that in as part of the whole inflation uh, argument here. Um, and then you, you saw in my uh, video, my last video, that James Gorman, the Aussie expat who is now the CEO of Morgan Stanley, has warned on higher inflation, but also higher interest rates. Just last week, so I've shared this chart: uh, the Australian three-year bond yield. Uh, in other videos and the argument is is can central banks do yield curve control some say yes some say no Um, and we can see that the rba uh, the three year just went vertical and when we jump over to trading economics you can see that uh, the aussie three year um, just in what since the third of june third fourth of june it was at 0.05%, 0.05%, and now it's at 0.4%. So, yeah, can can central banks, and will they do yield curve control, or will they allow uh, yields to rise? That is the big question. So that really is the big question, is what uh, central banks do. And you can see in this chart down the bottom, uh, Brazil have just list, lifted their interest rate. They've just hiked it. Uh, and Russia's been hiking, or, or their last movement was was up. Now both those countries have got um, you know high CPI. Um, now you can also see that there's very few countries that actually have um, positive uh, real rates. Um, so you can see India, uh, sorry Indonesia, and uh, and China. Uh, Turkey. Um, however, if you check out uh, Professor Henke's uh, inflation data, you'll actually see what Turkey's inflation uh, looks like there. Uh, Hong Kong and Japan. Otherwise, uh, everybody else has got negative real rates. And uh, the ECB's French advisor is proposing helicopter cash. The think tank said direct money transfers can boost inflation. However, the ECB have pushed back for now, but wait till they get their central bank digital currency where you know they can set up accounts with individuals and send direct transfer payments directly. That's happening in my opinion. So Australia, we have now joined the rest of the world with a trillion dollar government debt. And uh, the debt will pay until this boy is age 31. Now, I don't think we're going to be paying off the debt. In fact, deficits continue to rise in the foreseeable future. Uh, Look, I believe governments will try to inflate part of it away. Um, Look, Australia got uh, got lucky in the 2008 global financial crisis. We had no government debt. In fact, we had uh, funds in in the bank, so to speak. I think about twenty billion. Um, we were one of very few countries that had uh, a very good fiscal, um, you know, situation and and good uh, balance sheet. Um, and then China went on a massive, uh, you know, infrastructure commodity spend, which pulled us, which just kept us out from from experiencing what. The U.S. and Ireland and other other countries experience. However, next time, we're we're in the same boat. 
We've got debt coming out of our eyeballs, whether it's government debt, corporate debt, or household debt. In fact, you'll see in my next video, Property Market Warning, you'll see exactly how much uh, household debt uh, that we've got and uh, we break some world records there folks. So stay tuned for that one uh, So when Yeah, we we lift interest rates, you know, if we do get significant inflation interest rates yields rise uh, You know if the construction sector do face some difficulties over the next 12 months, which I'm expecting uh, the so-called good news that the government is spinning and that you're hearing in the media right now hearing from bank economists by the way, banks have got a vested interest, okay? You'll see in my next video how leveraged they are to the property market. It is their interest to talk a particular way and not tell you the truth, uh, but you'll get it right here on this channel. And that's where we'll leave part one. So join me tomorrow for part two as we look at Australia's economic collapse.